Good morning, everybody. It's Javier. I'm excited to be with you here this morning to share with you a little bit of information that can help you penetrate one of the most profitable markets out there, which is the law enforcement community. We're going to talk about how you, regardless of your lack of experience or experience with this market, can tap into truly a billion dollar market. And there are many ways to do it. Uh, we also have a treat for you today because what I'm going to do for those that are here today, you're going to receive an actual uh, link. And that link is going to provide you with a list of every law enforcement agency in the state of California. So one of the things that I always say, there's no excuses. All the information is around us. We just need to know how to find it. But today, I'm going to go ahead and bring that information to you. So the title of this presentation is going to be How to Teach Officers and to Bulletproof Their Financial Future, which is in dire need like never before. And I'll cover some of those reasons here in just one second as well. As always, first things first, I just want to welcome everybody to October. It's unbelievable that we are in October already and in full holiday mode in so many other, uh, so many places and stores and all this other stuff. So anyways, we got to make sure that we don't, you know, take our eye off the ball as we go into the holiday season. This is where a lot of people go and hibernate until next spring. Uh, you should not do that. I don't mind if people do that because there's just less people out there competing with what I do. And then when you really bring value to people, there's really no competition. And so we want to go ahead and make sure that one, uh, you know, recognize the fact that it's October. I also want to thank everybody who made the month of September such a good month. I also want to congratulate Mr. Uh, I don't know if he's on right now, but I thought I saw George earlier. But anyways, uh, Mr. George Munoz just uh, closed a nice rollover on the annuity as part of the marketing campaign that we just started in the last couple of weeks for a select group of people here. And it's a way of reigniting old clients staying in front of them during annual reviews. And we have a company that's actually mailing out postcards and stuff on your behalf. He, one of his clients responded to that. He met with them. And in the process of just doing the annual review, walked away with another, I believe hundred and something. I don't remember the exact amount, but hundred and seven thousand dollars. Yeah. Oh, go, 112, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead. What is it? 112,000 was the rollover amount, but wow. they, they think it was a, it was a client that, I haven't even spoken to in years, been trying to get a hold of them on my own when I had the time and the marketing just brought them and uh, made that appointment for me. And yeah, it turned it into a very profitable annual review. Perfect. Thank you so much. Congratulations to you and congratulations to everybody that again, made a September a very, very good month. We're going to get right into the classes. I want to open it up for questions at the end and hopefully you participate as well so that we can go ahead and keep this puppy moving. Now, let's start, talk about law enforcement. You know, why is it such a big deal to penetrate this market? What's well, a massive market? <clears throat> We're going to talk about more specific positives in just one second. But just to give you an example, I don't care where you live in the United States, understand that there's more than 900,000 sworn law enforcement officers serving in the United States as of right now, which is, by the way, the highest figure ever. And this is after a lot have left the profession, especially with all the stuff that we've been going through in the last couple of years, you know, some departments got defunded, so cops left and retired and all kinds of stuff. Now they're desperately trying to retire in almost every single police department in America today. So from a market perspective, it's a great market. It's a growing market, which feeds and fuels the most important element, which I'm going to cover in just one second. Now, if you live here in California, well, you get a little bonus because in California, we have the most uh, number of police officers than in any other state in the USA. Anybody know how many officers work in California? I'm just curious. Any guesses? Anybody? All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get into it right now in just one second to hopefully clarify that for you in just one second. As you can see here, there's over 93,000 officers in the state of California. That is a lot. Now, the good news, even if you are in one of these other states where maybe they don't have as many law enforcement officers, they are in direct proportion to the population of any community in America. That's just the way it is. And so, so if you're in some small town, uh, you know, that only has a police department of, you know, 10 police officers in proportion to the population, that's a lot because in, in relation to the population, the LAPD and the LA County sheriffs, which are the, you know, second and third largest police departments in the country, you know, they're the smallest as it relates to the per capita number of officers on the job. And so that's something that, again, you need to understand that no matter where you're at, you have the same chance, the same opportunity as the people that live here in California and LA and so on. And if anything, 
you build better relationships when you get to actually meet and know, get to know the officers versus just simply like us, we deal with almost a new officer every time we stop by any given police station as well. And so this gives you an example on a state by state basis, but the best state, like I said, is California as far as I'm concerned, because it's such a predictable market. And even though it applies to most other states, I'm just gonna go ahead and zero in on California and the same thing applies wherever you might be. Now within California, here's just a few of the police departments that sometimes when people tell me, I don't know who to call, I don't know where to go. Well, here you go. Here's a list that gives you the contact information of every single police department in California. Now this is directly from Post. And for those that don't know, Post doesn't mean the serial brand that most most of you might be familiar. Uh, Post stands for the California Police Officer Standards and Training. They are the licensing or governing body of every single law enforcement officer in the state of California. If you're a realtor, that's your, it's like their DRE. If you're a MLO, that's their NMLS. If you're our life insurance agent, that's their department of insurance. That's who approves every single officer and dictates what they have to know, when they have to know it, the continuing education. Everything revolves around post. They get what's called the post certificate. So if I want to go get hired by a police department right now, they're going to ask me, are you post certified? Do you have a post? certificate if i say yes here it is then come on in you're in if you don't well you have to go through the standard police academy wherever they might want to go and so anyways i give you some uh, background just so you understand the level of opportunity and also how the insights of law enforcement work and so it's obviously in alphabetical order but look at this this is just simply an unbelievable unbelievable and even though we're not going to talk about baker to vegas this ties in directly to baker to vegas because a lot and I do a lot of the police departments that are on this list are also part of Baker to Vegas. So if you wanted to just simply give them a call. Now, Baker, Baker to Vegas is not an evergreen campaign. That's only good starting now, because as a matter of fact, part of the reason I'm doing this class today is because this coming month, October, is the first Baker to Vegas meeting, the team captains meeting. So we're starting to take shape for next year's race. And what we have agreed to do this year is we are going to continue to be sponsors for them, but only if they actually give me microphone or camera time when we do it in person, the team captains meetings I'm, I'm referring to, and also via YouTube because we've been, uh, because of COVID, they were doing all of the team captains meetings via YouTube virtually. Well, even if it's virtual, they're going to give me five minutes to talk to the entire, uh, the, I mean, and I do the entire group of team captains that's going to help us stay even busier as well. So anyways, you can see all this right here. This is, and not only that, but going back to what I was telling you that while Baker to Vegas is not an evergreen campaign, it's cyclical. We run it, of course, in the spring. We are getting ready, starting here in the fall. There are a ton, and I do mean a ton of true evergreen campaigns I'm going to be talking to you about here in the coming weeks. This is just part one. In part two, we're going to talk about some of those campaigns. Some of them are very, very seasonal, like Baker to Vegas. Some are evergreen, meaning they are running year round, station funds, fundraisers, officers down, memorial runs, all those things that you can tap into. No, no matter where it is that you live, it's just a matter of getting a hold of them and knowing what to say. So this is part of that. We're not going to cover that today, but I do want to just go ahead and show you what an immense opportunity we have here in California and across the country, because every state has an entity like the post here in California as well. Before I go any further, if you could do me a favor, whip out your cell phone real quick. Thank you. Uh, whip out your cell phone real quick and scan this code. This will give you the actual Excel spreadsheet on top of that that I just showed you with all the information that you're possibly going to need. Please don't call me during the week. Please don't text me. Please don't email me asking for this because I will just simply ignore you. Uh, I don't do anything during the week that could have been done here on Saturday. And if you're watching the recording of this, look in the uh, comment section, if you would, or description of the YouTube video for it there. Don't mean to sound arrogant or anything like that, but I don't have time during the week for something that should have been done or could have been done on a Saturday. So anyways, let's go ahead and move on and get right into the first part. And this is just the very, very, very first part of the training, which is, of course, part one. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the challenges that most officers face today. Now, this is obviously at the personal level as law enforcement. Well, some of the risks are, of course, high-risk occupation. And what do we mean by high-risk? High anybody, 
come on, guys. I need you guys to do this, or I'm going to just skip right through the whole thing if nobody's going to participate. Why, why bother to show up if you're not going to talk? It's high risk because they can be they they can get seriously injured or possibly even okay. die. Physical, okay, obviously very very dangerous work in regards to what it is they're doing. Absolutely true. What else? Anybody? Emotionally high risk. Okay, that's very true. Emotionally high risk. Okay, absolutely. I mean, you know, we're at a time where a lot of people hate the police, and you know, you know, there's always a group of people that have always hated them, but there's a lot of people. Uh, hating them, so it's pretty depressing. Absolutely. What else? Anybody else? They, they have he- a lot of health problems. Okay, and that's we're going to come back to that specifically in just one second. Hold on, to, please bring it up again if I forget. Uh, also, another high risk. What we're talking about high risk. We're talking about liability. There's a lot of cities and a lot of police departments that are taking a step back right now, and in some states, they've actually taken away the law enforcement immunity. And so, when you sue a cop, number one thing everybody goes for is their pension. And they can't take it, and they have taken it, and they are taking it as we speak. So high risk is not just the physical element, the psychological element, but also the financial element that first thing you go for is their pension, and they get it. You get their pension for life, you get their home, you get their assets, and so on. And so that's a high risk. And so what we're, ta- what we're going to talk about in part two is how we shelter, or we can help them shelter. We don't give legal advice, of course, but as you guys know, things like the IUL are creditor-proof, which is pretty cool in regards to this element right here. Um, just mention the fact that it is high stress. You're going to work every day knowing that half the people you're gonna see hate you. They don't even know you, but they hate you. And so therefore, it's a pretty stressful situation to be under. And ironically, there are some writers that are not given to teachers because of stress, but they are given to officers. Officers are not excluded from that, which I don't understand why, but then I do know a few teachers and I kind of do know why, uh, because I don't think they handle it sometimes as well as cops. But Officers are not excluded from any, including the actual stress uh, exclusions that come with the IULs and most other forms of life insurance. So you have to know that because you're going to be bringing more value to them as well. Uh, They have a low income to lifestyle ratio. That's one of the challenges that most officers have, that as they climb the ladder, as they move down the uh, the cycle of their career, a lot of people, like in the rest of the uh, country, a lot of these officers are paycheck to paycheck because as they promote, they get a bigger house, they promote again, they get a bigger car, uh, then they get the boat, then they get the RV, and, and, and before you know it. So it's important to know where they stand, and it's a very predictable, and I do mean very predictable career path that I'll show you here in just one second. Uh, also burnout, and I think this is probably one of the greatest challenges in relation to law enforcement, because I don't think that a burnt out cop makes a good cop, to be very honest with you. And so, therefore, it's something that you sometimes have to do and understand this way. Uh, higher suicide rate than most occupations, that's another one right there. And, again, I'm not trying to be morbid, but we are professionals. We're big boys and big girls here and understand that that's just a real- reality of life. And that's where the two-year exclusion comes in as well, that if somebody does end up committing, I, mean, I can't say how many people, uh, you know, when I was a, law, a police officer and since then that I know that have been killed and have killed themselves, more have killed themselves than have been killed. And so that's something that, again, we have that two-year exclusion after two years. Even if they kill themselves, the policies we market are still paid out, which is something that, again, provides peace of mind because that's more of a mental health issue than anything else. But like I said, burnout is a very big problem in my world because that's why we sometimes have the issues we have with these officers that are burnt out and they just don't see themselves as being able to do anything else and are there just to be there. And I'm telling you, because I've worked with people like that, and I never like working with them again for the simple fact that they are not the ones you want making contact with the community when they just simply hate life, hate their job, hate everything. And that's where a lot of the problems begin. But that's just a reality, of course, of life. And if you don't believe me, uh, go to your local go go to your local DMV, okay, and see how they greet with a hug, and you can see the happiness in people's faces. It's called burnout. It's called sadness. Uh, but it's also called life. So I'm not going to get into it. I'm just simply saying that it is a reality of life. And so these are things that you can turn into positives, by the way, as it relates to what it is you do here in the financial environment. Something as obvious as saying, look, just because of the fact, that, well, who could tell me, who could address something like high risk or any of these things? How would you address any of these challenges within FFS? Anyone? We got to spit it out, guys. Pretend you were a big boy and a big girl. 
serious about no, we, we can alleviate uh, we can re relieve the stress of uh, financial stress for sure with our products what do you, like what what do you mean give me one example just one one example one yeah just guaranteed income guaranteed income and uh you know tax-free income okay that they okay that, okay perfect retirement. okay okay next somebody else what what can you bring to the well, table if, and just this if, if, if career change if the IUL is structured correctly and they started early enough, they could retire earlier. Okay, that's a, that's a, it, I'm telling you right now, if you ever want to understand what she just said, ask a teacher, ask a police officer, ask anybody the following question. Uh, how old do you want to be? I mean, ideally, how old do you want to be when you retire? And the number one answer you will get is, I would like to be today old when I retire. Because if I could walk away right now, I would do it. And so, well, maybe we can't help you uh, today, but instead of 55, what if we can help you get out of here at 50? And automatically your stock goes up because you just brought something to the table that's realistic and they understand that, but it's something that they would kill to be able to do. One thing that's not on this slide that I'm going to mention to you, most officers know that the lifespan of a police officer is shorter than the rest of the population, just so you know. And so... I call them dog years. If you want to be a cop, that's fine and, and, and everything. But just know, man, that for every year you're working, it's, you know, you're aging three years faster. And that's just the reality of life. Anybody else that has an answer? What, what do you bring to the table? Well, um, for sure, uh, spouse, is, it's really important to, to, to you know, to, to make sure that, uh, you know, as, as a couple that, that uh, you know, um, you're you're gonna uh, and you're the uh, you're the officer. You you know you you need to make sure that that uh, you know that uh, they feel that you know they're you know you're walking out the door today and then you're gonna come back, and you know if. Uh, so how would you ca encapsulate that? How what would you label that in five words? Let's say how would you encapsulate that? Because that's what we're here to train on. How do we enca encapsulate it? Family protection. Family protection. I would call it spousal peace of mind. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I just want to help you encapsulate all that. The boom, spousal peace of mind, knowing that obviously when you go out there, everybody's hoping you come back in one piece. But if nothing happens, if something does go down, at least you know that your spouse is taken care of. That's so perfect. Thank you. Good answer. Anybody else before we move on? Anybody? Well, the other thing, Javier, is that they can keep more of their pension by choosing a lower formula of the modification. Okay. That's we'll, the one we'll talk about that. Okay. That's a, that's a very good one. Okay. And everybody else needs to speak up, guys. We're going to wrap it up. I'm telling you, don't, don't chat. Just go ahead and unmute yourself. It's faster that way uh, as well. Um, also, higher taxable income base. Now, the reason that that's so, uh, Kathy, George has alluded to, you know, here you are as a police officer. So what I do when I'm in front of a police uh, officer or police officers, I always tell them, let's fast forward in time. Congratulations. You are now retired. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, that's a great thing. And it is a great thing. You're right. But you know who's also celebrating? Uncle Scam. And the reason that Uncle Scam is celebrating is because let's take a look at your taxable situation now compared to your working years. Number one, how much of your pension is taxable? And I think what, half? or No, 100% of your pension is taxable. Now, how much of your deferred compensation, your 457, how much of that is taxable? Well, all of it, exactly. It's called deferred, right? Because now it's time to pay the paper. So now you have that taxable income. Now, how many of your kids by the time you retire are going to be under 18 or still in college or living at home or dependents? Well, none. Okay, so those dependents are gone. Now, hopefully, hopefully you do what most officers don't do and hopefully you pay off your home so you don't have a, well, that's the goal. Okay, great. Let's just say you pay off your home. How much of a paid off home can you write off in taxes every year in interest? Well, none. None of it is there. Okay, great. So we have that going. And if you are like most officers, this week I just spoke to three of them who retired, they achieved the dream of retirement, they retired on a Friday, and they started new careers on a Monday. And so now your pension's taxable, your deferred comp is taxable, your new jobs income is taxable. So you have the most taxable income you've ever had in your life, and yet you have the least number of write-offs you've ever had in your life. So you can't pay it off, you can't write off a paid off home, obviously, right? Number one. Second thing that you have to take the, uh, into consideration, you can't use your 35-year-old uh, kids as dependents anymore because they're claiming themselves. That's true. And so all of a sudden, you find yourself with the most taxable income with the least number of write-offs. 
what do you think Uncle Scam's going to do to you then? Just, and if you don't believe me, when you do your taxes in 2023, just to get a taste of it, don't mention your kids, please. When you do your taxes, don't mention your home and don't mention the write-offs from your job right now that you have and see what Uncle Scam does to you. Would you do it if I ask you to do it? Hell no. Well, that's what you're going to be doing when you retire. So you have to encapsulate. You have to encapsulate these things in order for you to bring more value to people as well and more things. So here's a few more that I'm going to just go into. They're in tax, uh, tax heavy retirement plans or accounts. Uh, and by that, we're talking about, for the most part, deferred comp is the number one vehicle that police officers use to supplement their pensions. And their pensions themselves, of course, are 100 percent taxable as well. The only exception to that is if an officer is retired medically, then they receive 50% of their salary and it's income tax free. But anything short of it being a medical retirement or a medical pension, then it's 100% taxable as well. Uh, minimum tax deductions, I mean, that's one of the challenges that most officers face, even when they have the kids, because the kids help you. But again, a lot of these officers are making a lot of money. It's just that they don't know where the hell it goes. And so they're living paycheck to paycheck at $150,000, $200,000 a year, paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. And then Uncle Scam is taking more and more of that money as well, especially when they try to solve that problem by working even more overtime. They find themselves on more taxable income, and it just becomes a horrible cycle that they fall into. Uh, also, there's really no structured planning or guidance outside of their DBP or defined benefit plan or 457 providers. There just isn't. When we go into these police stations, that's probably the only time they have ever, ever heard anything about options for their retirement income. Even though there is a dedicated 457 or deferred comp office that handles nothing, you know, whoever, the way most departments do it, they award the deferred compensation contract to an agency, whatever, Hartford. Then Hartford has a little office over at City Hall that officers go to sign and retire, or whatever. But nobody goes to the stations, if you will. Nobody goes to the police stations to educate on the power of them or anything like that. And so that's why you can shine tremendously when you bring light to some of these officers by being the person that just at least got them to think. And so there's no structure planning guide. And you could be the one. I actually have, we're not doing it to next year. We postponed it from last two years to three years ago because of COVID. We were going to do it this year, but we didn't know what was going to happen with COVID. But as of January 1st, I don't have it here in front of me. Um, I think you guys saw, uh, let me just pull this up to see if I can see, I have time, I have time. Let me see if, hold on. Uh, hold on, I want to see if I can pull this up. And also, really Javier, while, while, you're, while, you're, while you're pulling that up, also, you didn't mention um, that taxes will probably be higher by the time they, they retire. So uh, do you, yes. do, I always ask them, do you think taxes are going to go up or down? Yes, and that's very, very true because understand, we talk, we cover that specifically, specifically when we are talking about the IUL as it relates to taxable income and tax brackets. Because like we said, you either you get tax now or tax later. There's no in between. And so what we are asking, and that's a very good point, is just that. Now, let me just start by a simple question. Do you think in the future, do you think, especially by the time you retire, do you think taxes are going to go up or do you think taxes are going to go down? And we're going to talk about that here in just one second. Very good point. Thank you. Great, great, great point to bring up. But anyways, what I'm going to show you real quick, and this is not the class today, but what you can do, and again, you're going to have to kind of figure this one out on your own because I don't have that kind of time. But what I'm doing is I have a company that's putting together an entire, and when I say entire, I'm talking an entire suite. It's a book. It's a website. It's the PowerPoint. It's a fully, fully fully branded we got stuck uh two years ago with the pen uh, of three years with the pandemic because i was waiting for the endorsement of the chief of police from the lapd only to find out that a lot of cops don't like the chief of police for the lapd so uh then it was going to go to villanueva the sheriff from LA county but it turns out he's in the middle of a re-election mess and so it might have to go out there without either one of those guys' endorsement it just simply says a must read for every police officer in the U.S. And then below that, the name of the chief or the sheriff or whatever. But at, at this point, it's too hot politically. So we're probably just going to launch it without it. But it's an ebook. It's also an audio book. It's the template of the PowerPoint. It's got a website. Cops go there for the information. I mean, it is an unbelievable machine. And so, like I said, so 
I'm just helping you think outside the box for those that are seriously or are serious about it. If you're not answering up today, don't waste your money. Don't waste your time. You're not serious enough. Just so you know, if you're not answering right now, I'll just save you the, uh, the money. So don't do that. So anyways, uh, decreasing pension factors is a tremendous reason that is also fueling the departure of a lot of police officers from law enforcement altogether. You know, there was a, uh, you know, there was a point in time where officers came into law enforcement and they were there for 30, sometimes even 40 years. And that was with the same department. Now, I know of one police officer that was with the, well, anyways, with, with the, uh, with the, he was in LA. From there, he went to Montebello. From Montebello, he ended up going over to uh, Arcadia. And then from Arcadia, now he's at the Orange County Sheriff's Department. I mean, they will hop around like it's nothing or leave the profession altogether. Me, personally, I always dreamed of being a police officer. I wanted to serve my community. I wanted to do all. But then when I got there, and when I saw the price that one had to pay, meaning away from your family, away from this community that hates you, uh, to me, as much as I loved helping people, point blank, it was just simply not worth it. Not worth it whatsoever. And it was an ultimate heartbreak because I thought I was going to be the 40-year cop and this and that. And I'll be very, very honest with you. A lot of officers are waking up to say, wait a minute, I'm making this much and I got to put up with this much crap. And people are trying to kill me, literally kill me all day long. With all, blah, blah, blah number of people are leaving in record numbers and so therefore you have that issue that i'll talk to you here in just one second as well and so a lot of different reasons uh, also challenges of the leo or law enforcement market itself what, what are some of those challenges well cops are paranoid man i'll be i'll be very first to tell you that if you're going to go talk to somebody if you're going to go try to sell them or whatever whatever the case might be just know that right out of the gate 95% of what you do is going to have to relate to building trust with them. Otherwise, the other stuff is not going to matter. That's why if you go up to a couple of, hey, can I talk to you? If you see them at 7-Eleven, can I talk to you real quick about whatever? They're going to tell you, uh, I got to go or whatever. I mean, they just don't, and they shouldn't. That's not what they're there for, of course. We want it to be at during the radio calls or what have you. But yeah, they are very paranoid. What else can you think of the law enforcement market itself? And we're, par uh, we're profiling because that's exactly what life is. One big profile. So before anybody gets their, you know, shorts in a bundle, in a bunch here, listen, yeah, we are par doing that. A anybody else? They're, they're creatures of habit. So, I mean, I Okay, we'll talk about that. Perfect. Okay. Uh, also, when it comes to finances, they're very complacent. They're very complacent because of what she just mentioned. And I'm going to cover that in just the next slide. Anybody else? What, what else can you think of for those of you that have dealt with them? Don't be guessing. I mean, anybody? All right. They're very skeptical, just so you they're, know. Yeah, and here's very what, skeptical. They're very, very skeptical. And here's, here's why I like skeptics. I love skeptics because you can overcome that with facts. What I can't stand are cynics. And there are, you got to learn to tell the difference. Is he being cynical or skeptical? Because I can deal with skeptical because I will break out my 100 cop reference sheet with names and phone numbers and say, here, if you really, really want to know if this is the real deal, call any of these 100. And if you need more, I have 100 more that I can send you by tomorrow. And so you can overcome that real quick. And so you got to understand which of the two. Also, they're very tough to deal with. You know, we have some people here in our team that won't even take more appointments than I try to give them because they're like, no, man, I made an appointment or he made an appointment, she made an appointment. They never kept it. You know, I showed up, they weren't at the station, they weren't here, uh, they worked overtime, so they couldn't get on the Zoom. And, and so if you're going to get into this market, you better learn how to deal with those things right out of the gate. And the way you, the way you do that is by earning their respect immediately and making them understand that, look, listen, my time is not more valuable than yours, just so you know, but it's not any less valuable than yours. And so I'm telling you right now, I know things happen, but I need to know that between a 1 and a 10, your intention is a 10 to be on the appointment. And if something happens, it happens. But And when you talk to them that way, not everybody can do that, then that's what you're going to see your success increase as well. They have a, uh, also, as an agency, law enforcement officers they have a very low savings rate. So that could be an issue depending on, uh, right now we're marketing one of our products that requires people to have quite a bit of reserves, quite a bit of a net value, if you would, uh, as it relates to uh, their net worth, I should say, for, for their blah, blah, blah. A lot of customers, unless they're retired, they're not going to qualify, man, because they are literally leveraged, leveraged to the max. 
and it's going to be very challenging to do that. Uh, other challenges of law enforcement marketing includes their culture driven, which we go right back to what Kathy was saying, and that could be good. That could be bad. How can that be good? Anybody? Anybody? If they tend to follow the culture, if you can get others to buy in, then you have an easier time of them following those that have shown that what we're doing works. Perfect. And just so you know, cops like anybody else, they just want to be have a better tomorrow because of what you bring to the table. And I'll give you an example. First, and the hardest thing and the number one reason people quit, and I'm talking about agents now, financial services agents, number one reason they quit when they try to get, uh, work the law enforcement market, what do you think is the number one reason? Anybody? What's the number one reason? Most don't even try, like you guys, that are not even trying to answer, so you're doomed. Uh, but everybody else that actually tries, why do you think they fail? Many of them. Lack of uh, immediate returns. That's it. it. Number one, you just hit it. That's it right there. I tried. I called this cop once. I called him again. He ignored me. I'm just giving up on the entire LAPD. Okay, then give up on the entire LAPD or the entire law enforcement community. That's fine. That's fine as well. But the number one reason is just that. He just said it. People quit. And by the way, if you want to look at why people quit trying to open schools, it's the same thing. Why people give up on this and that, it's the exact same thing. So you have to understand that if you were if you were to take on this market, you're going to have to stick it out. Now, having said that, if you go to, I, I can give you multiple police stations that took me six months, eight months to finally get in there, and a lot of money, a lot of donations, a lot of everything. But at the end of the day, once I was able to get in there, we literally cleaned house because one, once somebody purchases something, they need to justify to themselves and to others. And so the hardest part, which is why we give away jump drives, Baker de Vegas water water bottles, coffee mugs, whatever it takes, is once you get that one, he or she's going to run their mouth and make your life a hell of a lot easier. And so you need to know how to address that as well. Uh, any other quick thoughts on this? Challenges of the LEO market? Anybody? I mean, you're here because you obviously want to work it, I think. Uh, anything that comes to mind? Well, I mean, talking to agents, Talking to agents, I feel like some people um, kind of are just scared. <laughs> like they 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 don't want to approach police, or they feel uncomfortable talking to them for whatever reason. Okay, and, and here's what I tell people: if you feel that way, it's okay, it's normal, as long as you're moving forward. But if you if that fear paralyzes you, and I respect that, I went with the, I took somebody that wanted to go see a, a roll call presentation. And I took them to the roll call that we did at a jail, and the person didn't want to go inside. I go, we're not going to leave you in the damn jail. It's just that they work back here. We have to walk into the jail to get to their roll call room. And I don't know. I'll just wait in the car. I respect that. I'm not going to drag somebody in there. And so what I'm saying is if you already know that for whatever reason, whatever reason, you don't like cops or, or you, cannot, or you can't, get over, can't get over your fear, then I'll be the very first to tell you that you know this this is not for you and that's okay because I don't want you to waste your time and it's not worth you just simply uh, stressing yourself over. I mean, but that's a very, very good point. So anyway, let's go ahead and just get to the last part that I'm going to talk about today for part one. And that's some of the positives that officers have. We can't just talk uh, crap about them. Anybody, some of the positives that you can think of uh, most police officers possess. Anybody? If, Outside if of get Pat one, and George. Yeah, go ahead. they're loyal loyalty once they become your client they're probably the most loyal clients you'll ever have yeah that, they, there's no other more, more loyal client even more so than military than any there's just simply no more loyal client just so you know that that's number one what else Keith you had something sir go ahead yeah I was I was gonna say if you do manage to get some clients it just you end up getting a whole bunch more because it just goes down from then the wife, then the daughter, then to the friend, and this and that. Sure. After you, Perfect. after you break through the <laughs> all the challenges, you said a lot of challenges, right? Yes, and, and for a long time, not just a, a lot of challenges, but also for a long time. Okay, uh, well, anybody else? I mean, you anybody may find piece? that they're part of the community, being the heartbeat of a community, if they're very involved in their communities in a positive way. Sure. Yeah, and, and, and I think that at the end of the day, for, for my sake, and this is just, again, I I have had interactions 
good, bad, and everything in between with officers from my at more more interaction as a citizen before where I lived. I lived in South LA where I grew up and I was born and everything else. And knowing everything that I know and haven't seen, and very few people can say that. You haven't seen it from all angles of the community uh, and, and this and that. that you, you have to understand that they are the biggest hope we have as it relates to maintaining what we ultimately want, which is safety and peace in our communities. I mean, there's just nothing more important than that. And so I think that you know, you're absolutely right in regards to that, and especially where it's needed the most. That you just simply cannot argue. Uh, okay, perfect. Anybody else? Let, uh, before I go into this stuff right here, anybody? All right, well, I, what I'm gonna do- I find, I find that I, I have not had a single chargeback or any kind of reductions with my police officer class, like I do with teachers. I mean, I think that's a really yes. good thing. Perfect, and I completely agree with that. That they uh, that they're stable, uh, and, and it looks like about it. First of all, you have a very young workforce because if you're going to go into things like let's just say the IULs, you want you don't want the sickies and the old oldies. You know what I'm saying? Um, I always say that I look when I do roll call presentations and in the law enforcement community in the roll call room where you know where they're where they're there before they start their shift. It's very hierarchical. The brand new rookies are in the front. The more senior moving back and way the hell in the back of the damn room are the most senior people. And they're the oldest, usually the fattest and the sickest. Uh, that's just the way it is. And usually they are the ones that jump at the first chance to do something because they smell retirement. They smell Uncle Scam and they know that they're going to get screwed. And they're usually the ones that get turned down the quickest. So right now we do have a very young workforce. That's a very good thing. They have a very consistent and predictable pay, just like clockwork in uh, recession whether it's a depression, whether it's booming times, they're going to get paid. I guarantee you that they will get paid. Just to give an example, and I know people use this as a bad thing, and I don't think it's a bad thing. It's just more of a, a, a sign of where our communities and our culture lies. You know, in the city of L.A., 50 percent of the city budget goes to just law enforcement. And people think that it goes to the cops. And that's not true, because if you go to any police station, it's understaffed 90 percent of the time. Uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of all kinds of crap going in there. But the point that I'm making is that the officers are getting paid before anybody else in the city. And that's why for you as a financial professional, you can bank on it. Uh, also, nobody has mentioned the fact that they do have a defined benefit plan that most other employees don't have anymore, especially in the private sector. They have the 457, which is a class in itself about the fur comp. It has changed a little bit. And I'll bring you up to speed on that. And they're very impressionable. And impressionable simply means tying what everybody else has said, that when they see people doing something, they're like, damn, you did it? You signed up for it? Well, yeah, maybe you should take a look at it. And they're, they're, and so they're also very impressionable with facts because they're law enforcement. So when I ask them a simple question like, well, let me ask you a question. If you were to retire today, let's take a look at it. How much of your pension is taxable? And so they are, I will walk away and they will follow me to my car and say, hey, quick question. What if? What if my wife has a 457 or a blah, blah, blah? It, it sticks with them because they're very impressionable as well. Uh, also, they know they are inadequately prepared for retirement. And by the way, when we keep saying inadequately prepared, what we're saying is that the lifestyle that they like and are used to, most are not willing to give it up. They would have rather move out of state and go to Texas or go to Idaho and maintain a lifestyle and literally uproot the spouse and go completely far away from the kids and grandkids and friends and this, that to maintain their lifestyle before they say, OK, well, let's just go ahead and go from our, you know, four bedroom, five, uh, four, uh, four bedroom, four bath home with the pool. And let's just move into an apartment here in, in L.A., in downtown L.A. Or They're not going to do that. They'd rather. And so you will go further, not by telling them that they should start cutting down their lifestyle even though some do, but they do it in other states. And so you need to know that they're based on what they think they're going to get, just like teachers, how much do you think you're going to get when you retire a month? Oh, I think about 7,000. Well, actually, let's do the math. Uh, you're, you got 1,200 bucks coming, buddy. Uh, that's it. They're like, that doesn't even pay my damn mortgage. I go, well, you're right. That's why we really need to start planning and so on. Uh, they have a very predictable career that if you look at somebody 85% of the time, just by looking at them, you can tell where they are in their career 85% of the time. And I'll show you that in just one second. 
Uh, anyways, let's move into this. The typical police uh, career cycle usually starts with them being rookies. And when they are rookies, you want to stay away from them because they're not permanent employees yet. In the state of California, like in most other states, police officers during their first year have to go through what's called a probationary period, during which they can get fired without cause. They are not protected by the union. They are not. They, they are paying into it but they don't have the protections that the other employees have. So you never, ever, ever, ever want to write somebody up when they are a rookie because if for whatever reason they don't make it out of probation, they're going to leave the paycheck behind along with their job. And you're going to get this thing called the chargeback that some people are notorious for getting and others stay the hell away from them very well. And so when they are rookies, you will know that because most rookies, you see they have shade heads, they're bald, or they have, they're sitting in the front of the actual uh, roll call room, or they have long sleeve uniforms. They are the ones that have to wear long sleeves most of their first year, and so on and so on and so on. I want to stay away from them. Then they become permanent employees. When they go into the permanent employee status is when they are permanent now, and they're learning the ropes. That's probably when they're the most dangerous. They think they know it all, but they're really just off training. But one of the things is that that's where you want to start, start to talk to them. But then from there, they move into what's called their prime earning years. Now, they're training officers, they're sergeants, they're supervisors. And that, thankfully, is the longest phase of their career. Their prime earning years start almost, almost immediately, usually year number three to four. And they are because in most police departments, what pays you, your, your pay grade is not just your rank, but also how much time you have with the department. So everybody gets a pay raise. So if you, so it's not like you're, you're still stuck in the beginning of your pay cycle. It actually increases, and that is by far where most police officers spend the bulk of their career. So there's an 80% chance that when you talk to somebody at a police department that they are a great candidate for an IUL, for whatever product you want to market to them, and that's just the way it is. And then the only time you got to be careful, of course, is when they start to move into their pre-retirement years. And now that's actually blended and it's blended very well because now a lot of departments in California, like the city of LA is notorious for it. They have something that's called, uh, it's called the drop program, which is the deferred retirement uh, option program. And so what that means is they are retired. They're drawing a pension, but it's being placed in a special account and they're still drawing a paycheck. Now, when they get to the pre-retirement slash retired phase, your only real possibility there are rollovers to maximize their uh, return on the money or the functions of, let's just say, from them going variable to now that you can put them into an index product and so on. And so this is really important because this is also going to determine what you're going to market to them. Now, for 99% of all of us, it lies with the permanent employee. When they get off probation, prime earning years is where it's at. That's who you really, really want to want to talk to. Because when you start to get into pre-retirement and then, of course, retired status, what you don't have many, many times is health. And if you are talking about, let's just say, an IUL or anything that requires health, they're probably not going to have it. That's why I'm telling you that at that point, your options are going to primarily be annuities or some type of other product that doesn't depend on their health being a factor. And this is especially important because again, like I told you in two weeks, we have that class where I'm gonna give, give you an update as to how this has changed in California and most other states, but especially here in California so that you can get this going. I say this and we're doing this training today because we just brought on board a few people direct to me that are gonna be focusing only on law enforcement. And so all of you here have already seen and what I'm gonna do now let me go back over here and show you this because we're going to be moving it to a different server and I want to be able to show it to you right now before we do that. So go ahead and if you don't mind in your chat, I'm going to go ahead and paste a link. And the link that I shared with you right now takes you to what I'm going to show you here on the screen right now. And that is the roll call. So we are not taking people to roll calls anymore because we are regrouping everybody into what I would call hardcore police specialists. That if you're already qualified, you're still going to stay there. Nothing's changing there. We're still going to need your help. But what we're doing is there's going to be a new niche within our team that's going to focus the beginning to the end 
on nothing but law enforcement. We're doing during the week, we're holding special advanced training on how to calculate their pensions, uh, the different tiers that they fall and they are, are part of. And so we're going to do a lot of stuff. But as you can see, just by this webinar, for God's sakes, getting you to just answer up, is like pulling teeth. I don't, I don't want to do that. I, I, I hate being a one-way conversation. I can't stand it. And I think by now you guys know, what, you know how I feel about that because I want you to learn. And the only way you're going to reinforce what you're learning is by participating. And so, like I said, so we're going to go to a special cadre that is going to be doing nothing but no teachers, no friends and family from beginning to end, only law enforcement. Now, we'll still do our, we're still doing our Saturdays and we'll still bring police stuff to you. But this special cadre is going to be really, really, really hardcore. It's going to be really heads on. We're going to be going to different police stations once a week now that they are opening up again. And we're riding on the coattail, of course, of the Baker to Vegas campaign, which just kicks off officially. Like I said, this is our very first um, team campus meeting in October, and we're going to have them almost every month until the month of the race next year. And we want to make sure that you have the information. So you do have the link in the chat. I'll go ahead and throw it into the description box to make sure that you can at least view the way a roll call works. But we're putting together a new one. And we actually have a little, not going to call it a film crew, but two different cameras that are going to be catching two different angles at our next roll call because we're going to record it. And I want you to feel like you're sitting in it so that you can absorb the value that you can bring to law enforcement. Now, you don't have to be at a roll call to do it. You can talk to a local police officer, just make conversation. I know a lot of you here are doing that already, but we just are looking to take that to the next level by increasing the level of knowledge. And so, like I said, nothing personal, but uh, we're still going to be doing this on Saturdays. But during the week, it's going to be just hardcore for people that are actually already doing it. We want to enhance that. We don't want to. We don't want to have to work on getting you out of your shell, if you would. And that's a challenge that I just can't seem to overcome. Getting people to just participate, just try, just just give it a shot, type of thing. And everybody knows that that frustrates me just a little bit because I want you to win so bad. This is a market that's open twenty four hours a day, seven days a week in your community. For God's sake, it's not like you have to drive to a different state, a different city. There's a police station within five miles of your home, and it's nice to just hit, go to Chino PD and do a roll call and come right back home uh, 1.6 miles away, and I want you to be able to do that uh, as well. Oh, what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and turn it over to you to see if anybody has any questions, comments, concerns about anything. I want to go ahead and uh, address it right now before we wrap it up. Anybody? Javier, um, one, I wanted to know when that police captain meeting is, so if you could either text me or... I'll, 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 I'll hit you up, Kathy, okay, directly. Okay, thank you. And then we're, uh, George uh, and I, we're going to be doing a special training um, on Monday. It's a mindset training for advisors and agents, so we wanted to open it up to the rest of the team. Perfect, thank you. And then, what is that again? Zoom with George, or what is it? Uh, yeah, it's on Monday um, at 10 a.m., and then, um, George, can you put your, it's the link on, in the chat, please? Yeah, it's web chat, uh, web chat gm.com and i'll put it in the chat right now for everybody to follow type it in there okay then that's gonna be monday at 10 a.m thank you so much for opening it up to everybody uh any questions comments concerns about anybody this is your shot please go ahead and do that i'm waiting um, for that chat to get in there go ahead. Your, i'd like to be if i could be on that list as well only if every only if you're going to be participating. That's that's all. It's not an educational. It's a just drill for skill that we're going to be doing, and everybody needs to. We're not going to be begging people to you know say hi or something like that. This is people that are going to be productive. All right, I'll I'll, I'll send you something, Keith. All right. Okay. Cool. All right. Well. All right. Uh, George, just send in the. I don't see it in the chat. Did you send it? Yeah, I'm doing it now. I'm typing I'm slow. Fast. There. All righty, it's in the chat, so go ahead, webchatgm.com to join this Monday at 10 a.m. with George and Kathy. A mindset that's a very important training because I'm telling you, we want to be of the mindset that leads directly to activity. That's the key thing. We don't need to learn more. We need to do more, and it's okay to take out on some of this information, but it's even more important that you do something with it. Otherwise, remember, education without implementation is really just entertainment. And I don't want you to, uh, to be entertained. I want you to make money. I want you to make 2023 the best and most profitable year of your financial services career. But you're going to have to step up and do your part as well. Last call for questions, comments, concerns, once, twice. If not, have yourself a great weekend. And again, welcome to October 2022. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.